Welcome back to the Barbell Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Scott. With me today is Carlos Moran. He is a pretty elite power lifter, and uh, he's someone I have worked with for a long time and just seen uh, something different in Carlos that you don't see in a lot of athletes, especially in strength sports. So he is someone that has been at the top of his game for a long time and someone who just has been chasing success for a long time. And there's a lot of elements to success that I see that Carlos possesses to never give up on a goal and get there, uh, regardless of if everything always goes to plan or not. And uh, so I wanted to bring Carlos on just to talk about kind of those mentalities and some of the elements that that both of us kind of see to success and just kind of discuss them of what are the things that's really going to make someone successful with powerlifting in the long run, um, whether it be to get to an elite level or just, you know, continually improve to better yourself in the sport as a person, because uh, because powerlifting and, and strength sports can, can teach you a lot about yourself too. And um, they can show yourself a lot of true character and um, and others too. So I want to talk about that today. So Carlos, you want to tell us about uh, some of your accolades and also welcome to the show. Oh, well, thanks, Brett. I really appreciate that. Uh, that means a lot hearing all that stuff from you. I've been uh, powerlifting for about half my life at this point. So I'm 33. I just turned 33 last July. And uh I've been doing this since I'm about 17 years old, so it's it's been a quite a long ride, and I think I've been at the top of my game since about 2014 with my first like elite total. So it's been about another eight years of being a world class powerlifter since then. And uh, recently, I just totaled 1960 at 198, which put me at the time I think top four in all history, and I think that's put me back top five because the records keep shifting back and forth between the top uh, two to three uh, guys, with the exception of Pack being like the front runner right now in the 198. So um, and there was a- my most recent one. And then I think I've won like two or three uh, USAPL national championships back in like 2012. And then I've won um, like pro ams on and off since like 2015. So, and there was a point in time too, you were ranked number two in the world, correct? Yeah, I was ranked number two, I believe in 2017, 2018 and 2019 to hack um, officially. Yeah. And Carlos, you also now work with the juggernaut training system crew there. Oh. And um, I think I think a lot of people are familiar with them. So uh, it, it's cool to see how you've gone from, you know, kind of little, not little man on the totem pole, but to be recognized by uh, a big, you know, big person in the uh, in the field and influencer like Chad Wesley Smith to uh, have you as part of that team and see what you can do with someone like that as a coach. So, um, oh, for sure. yeah. So I, mean, I want to go ahead. No, no, no. It's just really funny that you bring that up because I've, I've known Chad since uh, his first seminar back at like total performance sports back in 2011. Um, so it's interesting that you put it that way. Cause one of the things that I did not want to do is become like a fitness influencer or somebody that had to like live and die by Instagram because uh, I've had Chad ask me uh, to be one of his guys like a couple times prior to that. And then there was a few opportunities with like SBD and Elite FTS and a few other powerlifting brands that really wanted me to take me under their wing, but I just felt like it wasn't the right time or the right opportunity. Um, you know, as you know, like I've had you as a coach and you've been my PT for like the last few years. And I know that I haven't seen you recently, but I do want to make it up there to take a look at some things. But one of the reasons why I didn't want to pursue that until recently was because I do have a nine to five. I do work in the finance industry as an investment portfolio manager. And I didn't want to make powerlifting a job because I feel like one of the things that made me really successful was passion. And I feel like once you make your passion into a job, there's a high tendency for burnout, which I've even experienced a couple of times myself when just taking powerlifting as a passion. So that was one of those things where I think his goals and my goals are really aligned. And when he gave me the sales pitch to join the team, it was really more of like, uh, I don't want to mess with anything that you already have had because clearly you've already made some success. We just want to kind of like pinpoint where your short hands are and to try to make those weak points into strong points. And uh, Chad's been very respectful. He's been a very down to earth guy. We've talked to, you know, we talk regularly. And one of the things that he is really adamant about is to make sure that like the sponsorship doesn't make me turn into something that I'm not, which is to be someone that does like a lot of advertisements or do like Carlos 10 discount code. If you sign up, 
Like there are bits of that, but it's less of an emphasis on that and really more I'm just trying to create good quality content. Um, so the information has really been paramount with that collaboration. So I have to ask too. So I've discussed uh, some of my experience with you with other lifters that are maybe younger. So, and just other people that have been in this industry. And a lot of people people don't know you by name. They know you by the Winter Wolves. Oh, that's uh, really they're like, Carlos, <laughs> like, I don't know. And I'm like, the Winter Wolves? Like, oh yeah, I know him. Uh, but you've deleted your Instagram a bunch of times. And so did someone steal the name or did you just decide to change it to the Wolves of Winter? Uh, it was originally supposed to be the Wolves of Winter. So I'm just a really big Game of Thrones fan. And uh, I read the books when um, when I was like in my like mid-20s. Uh, that's originally what I wanted it to be, but it was already taken. So I went from the Wolves of Winter to the Winter Wolves. But as soon as I found out that you could get that name back, I just switched it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have deleted my Instagram a couple times, mostly just because of burnout. Um, I remember I went to the Kern, which was like the biggest, um, pro invitational meet in the world. And I had such a bad experience with it that I literally just said like, screw it. Like, I just want to just take like six months away from powerlifting. I want to like, just not even think about competing because it was such a weird way in camaraderie. I was talking to other lifters where we weren't even talking about numbers or competition. We were talking about like Instagram followers and like following each other for clout that it just left a bad taste in my mouth where I deleted it for quite a bit and uh, needed to like turn my brain off from that part. So I've, I've deleted it a couple times because of that. But the recent name changes literally because I've always wanted it to be that. It just never had the chance to until, uh, uh, okay. until I did. So that's the I story. was wondering that a while ago. Sometimes when I, I look and see your stuff pop up, I wonder. But anyways, let's get into the nitty gritty here. So as I said, I think there's there's a bunch of key elements we could take uh, and look at and see what, what it takes to be a successful power lifter. But I want to talk about maybe five of them today. So um, one of the first things I've always seen is just, you know, there's this drive that that some people tend to have that other people don't. And... Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things someone can do with their life and powerlifting is one that is not always rewarding. It it doesn't always have this great satisfaction to it. It's not always fun to put yourself under heavy bar every day, especially when, you know, some days aren't good and you still have to do it because it's part of training. Uh, there's plenty of pain that goes along with it. So there's there's some pain, there's some, some pleasure with it. And, um, you know, there's plenty of successful people in it. And I just, I've seen three kind of main things with that. So I want to, I want to talk about that. So what is your drive to just like, what is it? You know, I asked myself that, um, a lot quite recently, uh, just because we have, um, a juggernaut seminar at the end of the month at Cambridge strength. And that was one of the questions that even Chad asked me is like, why do you want to keep doing this in like in year 16 or 17? And, um, I think it has more to do with like, why not than why? Uh, I remember my first coach, his name was Steve DeLillo. Uh, it was at TPS. And he asked me what my ultimate goal was, and it was to be the best power lifter in the world. You know, and I had no idea of Ed Cohen. I had no idea of any of the lifters prior to that. I just thought that the sport was really cool because I saw who I uh, turns out to be Greg Kenora squat a thousand pounds, like I think a year or two earlier. And I had no idea that powerlifting was a sport. I was like, I want to do that. I had zero comprehension of what it took to squat 1050, I believe was the actual weight. And I was just like, I just thought that that was super cool. And I wanted to say that I lifted a thousand pounds because I was also really and still to this day, like really into superheroes, into the Marvel DC stuff. And I just thought it'd be cool to kind of be like a quasi superhero lifting like a thousand pounds. Um, so 16 years later, I still have that passion to want to be the best because I figured, well, if someone else can do it, why not me? And that's been always my like primal instinct to kind of keep going because I don't see why it can't be anybody. I mean, people talk about genetics, environment, training, all these other things. But I do think the number one thing that you have is to ask yourself, well, why not me? And that's kind of been always my thing, for sure. Yeah, because regardless of how how good your genetics are, um, that doesn't matter if you're not going to try hard with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I've uh, you know I've actually won against people that definitely were genetically superior to me when it comes to powerlifting. Like um, the former 181 world record holder, who's also a, a friend of mine. His name is Ben Puccio. Uh, we've gone back and forth, and it came down to like the last deadlift most of the time because I would get into his head mentally by just kind of like talking trash. And he would just crumble every single time. And uh, it was just really funny to see somebody that was like literally built pretty much like Ed Cohen play second to me, not because um, of anything other than just like the mental game towards like the last deadlifts when it kind of was a back and forth. 
because on paper he should have outtotaled me by hundreds of pounds, but uh, he didn't just because uh, it came down to the mental part of it um, when it comes to powerlifting. So there's been times where like I definitely should not have won meets, but but because I was able to either mess with somebody or make it close enough where it did come down to like the last pull, you know, you either get it or it's going to slip because the pressure gets to you. So I've been pretty proud of those types of moments too. Like my first um, world championship was raw unity and I won against Joe Sullivan, who's now like this awesome 220, 242 guy. And it came down to the last deadlift and we were close enough where like if he missed it on his second and third attempt, I would have had total him by like 50 pounds. So he had to do something uncomfortable in terms of like his out of his range a little bit for a conventional. And, uh, and he missed it twice. And I basically went three for three because there was no pressure on me to make those hit deadlifts, but it was up to him in order to, you know, win that weight class. So there's been times where like someone like him has been a lot better on paper, but because it kind of came down to some pressure, you either rise to the occasion or you don't. And it's been, you know, a lot of that too as well. And that's one of the things that I do like about Powerlifting is that it's not necessarily the strongest guy, but most of the time it's with the most strategic or the most cerebral lifter. Mm. And so would you, so, so you kind of said, it's like, well, you know, Someone's going to be the strongest guy in the world. Why? Why not me? Yeah. Um, so, would you say? So, so you truly believe in yourself that you can do this, and that like you have a high sense of self, and the fact that like, well, I I have, I I can do it because I have the tools, I have the drive, I have this. Correct. Yeah, it's a it's a very like specific, highly egotistical way of thinking. Which, if I let it out of that like lane, it makes me become like the biggest. Uh, not fun person to be around. I'm going to try not to swear uh, just because um, you can swear. It's fine. There's no, well, I just don't want to be a huge piece of shit. And i definitely have let that type of thinking out of that lane. And if I let it into my personal life, it's definitely very toxic. It's a very toxic way of thinking. Um, but I'll put it to you like this. We have TPS Titan barbell. We have your place up in architect. We have CSC and we've had some like people like Mick Scallion, people like Eric, people like Nick Camby. Brittany Diamond at one point when she lived around here, we have some of the best strength athletes in the whole world, just all within like 20 miles of each other. So I think excellence breeds excellence. And because I have had a lot of these people become training partners or friends or both, you get desensitized of what you think you're capable of. Because if you see people lifting world records all the time, then you're going to ask yourself, well, if they, if these two or three people can do it, why not me? So like, I think a part of the reason why I do have that mentality is because I have been surrounded by so many great athletes and they've all done well in their respective sports. Like I saw Camby for the first time, like in two, three years, and he's one of the best 231 world strongest men in, ever. And to have him be like a former roommate, like drinking buddy back when we used to live in Southie to be in training partners, it's it'd be weird to not think of myself being in the same realm as him, even though we're in different sports. So I say like, if, if Camby can do it, and we used to get like trashed like on a Friday night together, then I don't see why we I can't do the same. So it's kind of funny that like you see other successful lifters and you see that they're not different than you. They're, they're flesh and blood. They're human. They all have their strengths and weaknesses and you have to recognize your own as well too. So I think being surrounded by a good training environment where you have that type of caliper lifter, you know, makes a difference as well too. For sure. And so there's actually, so it's interesting. So I've been studying a lot about business now with the businesses I own and Something I came across is there's three common traits in the business world, at least this was considered in the business world, of th the three most common traits of successful people. And it was high sense of self was one of them. Mm -hmm. And then paradoxically, the other one, and I want to talk about this a little further, is inferiority. So it's like we have this high sense, and, and I feel this way too about myself with business at least, of like yeah, I can do this. Like, I want to be the best. I want to have the best practice. I want to have the best gym. I want to coach the best lifters. I want to be the best coach, right? And and I do believe that I can do that. However, at the same time, there's this drive inside of me, um, whether it be fail of failure and the sense of inferiority of like, nothing I do is good enough. Like, I never settle for what I do. Like, I could hit all my goals and do exactly what I set up to do and do it. And, and I've done that in business too. And it's like, it, it's a blessing and a curse. And I, I see that with a lot of people in the strength sports too, right? It's like, yeah, I did that cool. But like, now I have this other goal. It's like, mm -hmm. you did that. And then 
you know, as Bill Belichick would say, we're on to Buffalo. <laughs> yeah. We're on to Cincinnati. Yeah, no, I, it's funny too, because I do have a Bill Bel- or like a Belichick way of looking at things like don't ride the highs too high and don't ride the lows too low. Because I definitely was a lot more, um, like I, I'm an emotional person in general. So I used to get very emotional with how well training went. So if it went really well, ride it high as much as you can. And then when you have a bad training session, it's the end of the world. And one of the things that I've been better at in terms of practicing, not just in uh, training, but also in like my personal life, because I've been reading a lot of like uh, psychology stuff in regards to attachment theory, where like having an anxious attachment is very much who I am as a person. So like that whole not being good enough is also another, like you're saying, paradoxically, a huge primal drive for me, where like, even if I was to be the best powerlifter ever, I would also still feel like, well, that's still not good enough, because I need to make now the space between first and second even bigger. Because then I can truly say that I'm good enough. And, but you know, yeah. that you can't quantify that. So it's always going to be like this huge thing of like just always trying to be good enough, whether in your eyes or in the eyes of your peers. Um, so, with that being said, uh, I, I do think that it's really funny that you bring that up because that is like, like you said, the second thing that I think of after thinking, why not me? It's like then also like, I hope I'm good enough to be able to accomplish it. Um, because, and I, and I do think it also comes down to environment as well, too, because not to like talk about drama or, 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 or anything around those lines, but I also was like in a very toxic training environment. When I first started where you kind of had this hierarchical, you need to prove yourself to be good enough to even train with the training group. And then because of that, I've always kind of had that mentality of like, I need to be sure that I'm good enough to even train with the people that I train with on a daily basis, let alone my own personal goals. So it's always been this weird feedback loop of like, I hit a PR and then I'm like, I hope this is still good enough that my peers want me to still be their training partner. Uh, at the same yeah. time so it's kind of weird how that kind of works because like uh i know that i'm good enough but at the same time i still want to have that external validation of my peers to make sure that i can still be part of the group or the or the training group and yeah. i think you've seen that at spindle when we used to train together you know and i've you know done that at csc and you know now at titan you know it's very much like a push and pull of like wanting to do well but also at the same time wanting to also be good enough to be you know a good training partner a good mentor things of that nature So as we're saying, you know, there, there's a lot that there is positive to this drive. And, and would you say there's aspects of that too, that uh, has a negative impact on your life at all? Oh, for sure. It's something that I've been constantly working on, especially within like the last six months, I want to say. Um, like I've, I've actually gone to see a therapist for like my personal life. And then I went to go see uh, like peer counseling um, with my relationship. And not that there's anything necessarily wrong, but it's just kind of staying on top of things because I think when you do have that mindset of like wanting to be the best and if you let it out of that athletic endeavor and you put it into your personal life, it is very toxic. And I've definitely seen how it could um, ruin interpersonal relationships and just trying to stay on top of or being ahead of that as well too and being very mindful of like, there's a reason why you're doing this in terms of being an athlete, but also at the same time, it shouldn't be the only thing that defines you as a person. And for a very long time, separating Carlos the powerlifter versus Carlos Rand the man was very much one-to-one. And now having some sort of, I don't want to say separate identity because powerlifting is a huge part of my life, but it's not the only thing. And that I have a lot more to offer to not only myself, but to the people around me other than just being a powerlifter. Because for a very long time, I definitely was not the best you know, son, brother, friend, boyfriend, things of that nature to everybody around me because I kind of let the whole persona of a powerlifter kind of get the best of me. So learning how to separate that and literally just having a very single-minded focus when I'm in the gym versus when I'm not in the gym. So it's almost like flipping a switch now as opposed to like letting it infect the rest of my life. Cause I think it's a very good thing, but at the same time, too much of a good thing is also a bad thing as well too. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's this fact of like being successful makes you happy, but it's like, well, how long does that make you happy for? It's like you train for this meet, great, and you do it even if you kill it. It's like, okay, like that's over. Like that makes you happy for a little bit of time, but it's like I still just – I don't feel good enough. I want to do more, and it's like this this never-ending cycle. And um, so that kind of brings us into the last part of you said of like, yes – this this is a good trait in some ways, but there's also been a downside to it. So the last key that they've shown for all people, uh, all successful people, the third and most common trait was uh, a high sense of impulse control. And so I think that's kind of that piece there that puts the glue together between 
having a high sense of self being, you know, having the thoughts of being able to do this and then having the sense of not, it's not good enough. And I think having that mental switch back and forth or this like push pull between the two and then the sense of impulse control to be like, okay, am I overstepping here? Am I taking this too far? And am I making brash decisions just because of the way I feel right now in the moment, which could be very high or could be very low. We don't know. I think that's the part there that really ties it all together. So uh, could you touch on that within the realm of, of powerlifting and success there of what do we need to know about impulse control? It's probably the hardest thing I've ever had to learn to be perfectly frank, like that piece. And like, you know, personally that I'm very impulsive when it comes to training where I'm like, fuck it, let's do it live in terms of like going for a PR or or, uh, doing a meet or things of that nature. So this is still something that I'm still wrapping my head around. So I can't say that I've really mastered, but I do think what's different this time around versus like the last few years has been, uh, has honestly been the hamstring. Cause when I, you know, I blew on my hamstring squatting, uh, trying to attempt to squat 805. And for up until very recently, like the hamstring has been giving me issues. It could be very hard to squat sometimes and sometimes it's completely pain free and it's been very back and forth. But just realizing that like and having the self-awareness that this can all be taken away in an instant, although it's very terrifying to think of it that way, it's also very refreshing to realize that like you have to have some self-awareness of like how much are you willing to give up in order to keep going and are you okay with that decision? So drawing that line in the sand of like, all right, I literally have given up my life to powerlifting quite literally because I, not to be over dramatic, but I could have died. Uh, 805 pounds is enough to kill a person or two. And just realizing that you can walk away from it. And although I was in crutches in a wheelchair for a month afterwards, realizing that if I was going to keep doing it, that I really, really, really want this. And not just because I only kind of want it. So having that switch of like, if I'm going to do this, I have to make sure that it's very precise, very um, direct in terms of myopic focus. But realizing that myopic focus has to be just to be in the gym, because if I let it consume me like I have in the past, then I'm going to be overthinking the hamstring every single time. So not saying that everybody should get injured necessarily, but having that self-awareness that this could all be taken away and you have to realize that like, if it does, what are you going to do when it's over as well? So having that switch of back and forth and having other things that enrich your life as well too, outside of powerlifting is also not only just very healthy, but it's a lot easier to flip that switch on because I think it's a very, like you said, very careful balance between pushing and pulling in that regard. Yeah. And so looking back at your powerlifting career thus far, would you say that impulse control or maybe you haven't thought about it but would you say because you said that's like the hardest thing you've had to learn would you say that's been maybe the denominator that's given you maybe not the success you've wanted for yourself in the sport no i think i just have too much of a high sense of uh, self <laughs> my ego is a lot bigger than i think i, I even let it shown even when i do let it out um you know, I've wanted a 2000 pound total for like the last five years. And I think I've been capable of it for the last five years. I just haven't put it together because um, I don't, I wasn't as attentive to detail until the last couple of years. So I think trying to put a meet all together and then just trusting the coaching that I had, because I am very skeptical of everybody um, that has coached me. And, and, and to a degree, I'm still skeptical of Chad. Um, I feel like having a healthy sense of skepticism in terms of your training is still a good thing. But I do feel like the difference now between five years ago and today is that I try to let people do their jobs better. So if I have a coach, let the coach do their job. If I have a PT, let the PT do his job, you know, and just kind of stay in your lane and realize that like as an athlete, if you question too much, instead of just like general questions, like, should I do skull crushes instead of pushdowns or should I do you know, extended pause bench versus like incline, like stuff like that is okay. But I think if you question the overall periodization plan of your coach or the overall periodization or rehab plan of your PT or so on and so forth, then you're not going to be able to put everything together. And I think the number one thing is to just trust the people that you surround yourself with, because if you can't trust the people that are supposed to be in your side, then how are you going to do well? And I feel like one of the biggest hurdles that I had to overcome was just to let people in and be vulnerable as an athlete and just let the coach do his thing let you know you do your thing and then the people that are there to handle me or to support me to just let them do that instead of just like overthinking everything so i think that that was the, my biggest enemy or my worst enemy was myself in that regard um because i had some minor success but i never was truly happy because i think i overcompensated these lofty goals that i had that were probably five percent more than what i was capable of 
And also at the same time, thinking that I had to do everything myself because I couldn't even trust my own coaches. Mm -hmm. And so practical skepticism is a another trait I see in a lot of people. And it, it it's it's a balance, like you said. Like I was thinking the other day, like we just have this kid in the gym that just He's an awesome client and he's had so much success. Like he's not the most skilled or talented person in the world, mm -hmm. but he's just, he's made an incredible amount of progress. And one of the things is I was just like, you know, he just comes in every day and does exactly what, what he's told to do. Like he doesn't question the coaches. Like if something's bugging him or something hurts or whatever, he lets us know. He's like, what, but it's like, what should I do instead? It's like, go do this. Like, okay. And just goes and does it. And when he sticks to the plan and he just communicates with us about how he's feeling, how things are going, what's working well, what's working not like it fucking going great. Um, and it's just like in the past eight months, I think he's put like, you know, he's kind of doing super total training and he's put like probably 200 pounds on his total in like eight months. That's and it's, yeah, yeah it, it's like, he just keeps getting better. And it's like, he just shows up every day. He's consistent. He does what he's told and he sticks to the plan and um, he doesn't have the highest sense of self, which I think he could be even stronger if he did. Mm -hmm. But when I tell him he can do something, he's like, Oh, I can do this. Okay. I trust him. And then it's like, he does it. Like if I had skeptical, uh, a sense of skeptic feelings in, in my voice of like, yeah, I don't know if you can do this. Like he probably wouldn't hit it. But when yeah. I'm like, yeah, you can do this. He does it. So it's, it's having that belief in someone, but also like um, believing in the coaches around you that, that they know what they're doing and, and that trust. But also like, you know, there is a side too of like, and I, I see this a lot in powerlifting of it's like the grass is always greener. There's, you know, social media, there's so much. And I talk about this a lot too. It's like the grass isn't always greener. Like when it comes down to it, powerlifting is, is fairly simple. Um, and if you do the work, you'll typically see some results to a certain degree, right? But everyone always thinks there's something better. It's like, we need to make sure what we're doing is right and makes sense. But other than that, like, yeah, let, let the people around you that are there to support you do their jobs and, and just trust the process. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest things that um, a lot of people that, that aren't successful in the sport are the ones that, that they don't want to put that on, the, on themselves, they, you know, they have a bad meet and then it's like two weeks later, you see, they have a new coach and then, um, you know, and then they do another meet and then it's another coach or back to the old coach or, um, and like, sometimes you need that. Sometimes it's like, yeah, this just isn't working for me, but I've seen it a lot with, um, some athletes where it's just like bounce, 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 try this, try that, try this and never stick to anything long enough to actually see it through to make it work. Yeah. And so, um, you've bounced around from coach to coach too, but you've also like, I know you worked with Mike for years. Yeah. And then like we did some work together to kind of rehab you from some injuries and get you better. And then you went back to Mike, you knew, you knew how he worked. You knew that process. So I was like, that's, that's cool. That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like, people never want to take, take it to themselves of like, okay, this is what I need to do better next time. Instead of blaming the program or the coach, yeah. it's like, there's so many factors to it that we need to look at. Yeah, and I think having like a very, you have to have that sense of skepticism in yourself as well too. It's like, well, because it's an individual sport. So as much as, you know, there's a lot of people that are there to support you, you still have to do it. And I think the biggest thing that I've seen, at least with, and not to make this like making fun of Zoomers and because, you know, as millennials, we're just going to be like, well, these kids these days, you know, they don't know how good they have it. Um, I do think, generally speaking, from what I've seen at Cambridge, and then at Titan, and just from all the gyms, because I like to change the scenery as well, too. Like, I don't like sticking to one place for years on end, because I do like seeing other people, and I've had made a lot of friends um, through the sport. But generally speaking, the younger crowd that I've seen do not, they don't take as much ownership on themselves for putting in the work. And I'm general, I'm over generalizing it, um, because I think when they see influencer coaches, not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but like taking the example, like say Sean Noriga, he coaches hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different um, athletes. A lot of them are going to have a, a lot of similar programming, if not almost the same exact program, because there's only so many SBD days that a powerlifter can do, right? And I think when you have 
lifters that live and die by those SPD training days. And then they expect that they expect that just because they can do that in the gym, that they can just kind of replicate that type of day at a meet, not realizing that meets have their own thing. They're their own different animal. That's going to be a lot different from like a regular gym day and not realizing that like, just because it was perfect in the gym doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be exactly replicated. It. It's hard to, I think you have to look inwards with your, that type of lifter to realize that like not everything is going to be perfect. And you have to realize the attention to detail at a meet is going to be a lot different than say at the gym. Um, whereas like somebody like myself, who's been doing this for a really long time, I always anticipate things to go wrong because meets never tend to go right, you know, or perfect. And I think having that experience of like, realizing you can best prepare for yourself, but things do happen and you do have to recognize that like one, you still have to take responsibility even if things are out of your control. And then to recognize that it's never going to be perfect. And I think a lot of younger lifters, they're similar to baseball players in terms of like, if they don't have like the right gloves, the right bat stroke, the right stance. And in this case, you know, bar, you know, combo rack, if they don't have the fat pad versus like the small pad or whatever, you know, whatever it may be, then they're not going to have their best day ever because they're so acclimated to having it exactly the way that they want to, not realizing that there's always going to be some sort of mishap on a meet. And I think, um, I think, I think younger lifters have to recognize that like things are never going to go perfect. So don't anticipate perfect, just anticipate being really good. Cause I think perfection is the enemy of good as the cliche goes, because you know, almost, almost never happens to have a perfect day. I've only had one nine for nine day back in 2018. And even then that wasn't a perfect day. Like I did things to make sure that I had a nine for nine day, but it wasn't exactly hitting perfect goals either. So you know, I do think that, you know, realizing that you have to take some personal responsibility and recognizing that like, things are probably going to go wrong, even when things do go right. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, meat, meats are a totally different monster. And, uh, you know, between the adrenaline of being on a stage in front of people, uh, it's the, the, depending on which sport, weightlifting, powerlifting, six or nine lifts that really matter. Like you've been training for six months to a year for this. And it's like, it comes down to, you know, two to three minutes of actual doing something total. Uh, that makes a big difference. And then like, you know, you're dieting, you're cutting weight, you're doing a water cut. It's like, yeah, no shit. You didn't like hit a hundred percent of your max. Uh, and this meat is, you know, it takes three or four hours when like, how often do we train for four hours in the gym? We don't with, an hour break in between. It's a very different atmosphere. Uh, but you brought up another good point there of training environment. So as you said, and, and what I've learned to, whether it be my own training business, the way I work, like being in an environment that stimulates you. Right. So, um, for me, I love my gym. I, I work out there four days a week, but there are days where I've been there since seven o'clock. And when I get on the floor to train at five 30 at night, that environment to me isn't always stimulating. I don't always have the best workouts because it's just like, okay, I've been here. Like the excitement is dampened. Like I get jealous when my people that work nine to five at a desk come into the gym. Cause it's like bright eyed and bushy tailed, like yeah. the bright lights are on. There's all these shiny toys. I get to move instead of sit at a desk all day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think for a lot of people, that's very stimulating. And that's what stimulates me to do better and uh, and be a better athlete myself. So um, I I want to hear you talk about that a little more because watching your training is very interesting. Like it always seems like the environment you have behind you is very motivating and stimulating. I'm like, God, like I wish I like, and sometimes you train super late at night, which like I would never want to do, but it's almost like I get FOMO sometimes watching your videos because it's like oh. there's a... Uh, it just there's such like a high energy behind you as like a driving force. Well, I appreciate that. I miss you too, Brad. I can't wait to train it together at some <laughs> point. But uh, in all seriousness, it's funny that you mentioned that because I've actually been going the other way lately. I've actually liked being more of an introvert and actually training alone in my condo because I have like an office space that I converted into a personal gym where um, I have my alone time because I feel like I have too much time trying to be with other people and trying to push them to be the best versions of themselves in the gym where sometimes I need to take a step back and be like, Hey, listen, I need to have some focus on myself. And then, so when you see those videos of, you know, the same five to 10 people that have been spotting me on my heavy squats or, you know, on my deadlifts, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, it's almost like it's too much for me where it's like, I prefer like the weightlifter, 
meat mentality of like everything being just really quiet so I could just kind of get to work and just kind of not treat the weight so seriously sometimes because I do think there is an overstimulation factor, especially when it comes to deadlifts because I'm not the best deadlifter in the world where if I have too many people watch me deadlift too heavy, I I mentally break down because I'm just like, why are you guys watching? Like, get a, like stop looking at me, that whole type of mentality. So I kind of like doing the whole gym, home gym stuff. But when it comes to um, the group training environments and the, you know, the yelling and the screaming and the, all the hype and stuff like that, I think one of the good things that I can say as a lifter and as a mentor as well is to cultivate that environment where like regardless if it's somebody that's squatting 135 or 770 pounds, um, we all treat that lifter with that same decent amount of respect and positive reinforcement uh, because coming from a gym prior to that where it was very different and very hierarchical, you know, everybody should have like their, you know, two seconds in the sun to really kind of like take it all in and enjoy that PR, go for that attempt because you worked really hard for it. So as much as people are like, you know, screaming and trying to hype me up to make sure that I don't die squatting, um, that's kind of been the mentality for every lifter there. And that's just something that I like to cultivate because I do think that when we push other people up, you push yourself up as well too. And I do think finding service and helping others is also where I get some satisfaction to get myself stronger. Because if I can make the people that are more of a beginner intermediate stronger, then the gap between those people and myself, even if they're slightly smaller, makes me want to kind of go this way and push the window towards that way where I want to kind of keep getting myself stronger because I don't want those kids to catch up to me either. So it's kind of like this cool feedback loop of like, they're pushing me because even if they're squatting 500 pounds, I'm like, well, that's 250 pounds closer to my squat. I got to make sure that the distance is 300 pounds now. So they hype me up and I do the same for them because we're trying to progressively overload both, you know, both uh, parties here. And that's kind of been kind of the mentality at CSC especially is like, you know, I can't let the kids get stronger than me or get close to getting stronger than me because that means that I'm taking a backseat to my training when I don't want that. So that's kind of how okay. that works. Interesting. Yeah, there, there's definitely times too, like I, I'm in a, I'm, I'm working with people all day and everything. So it's like, there are times I do like that, like, you know, chill, no one in the gym or me and my headphones on kind of keeping to myself. But then there are days too, like I go back and forth with the both, but um, it depends what I'm doing. It depends on the intent of the day and everything too. Like, you know, I don't know about you, but like, I never want to max out with, uh, you know, with like you would with like 750 on your back in my garage gym by myself like that doesn't seem fun to me that's yeah. not the environment i would want for that um but if i'm doing like accessory work and just some simple movement mobility stuff like yeah i want a quiet environment and, like the lights down low almost to yeah. uh just kind of relax a little bit more and, and tone down the sympathetic nervous system oh for sure yeah one but, of the good things that i've uh <laughs> recently really enjoyed with um with laura uh, my girlfriend is that we um when we train together, because she was a personal trainer for 10 years before she left the industry, um, is that we both are very serious when it comes to training, but at the same time, we don't really talk a lot to each other. If anything, I probably annoy her more often than not, because I'm more of the talker in between sets. So even though we might have different days, one of the fun training sessions I have is like I have like this one accessory bench day, which takes about 45 minutes that if I was at CSC, it would take two hours just because of the music, the simulation, everything like that. But we'll go to a lifetime fitness together that's you know, five minutes away from where she lives and we just get to work 45 minutes. And if I need a handoff, she's more than happy to spot me and things of that nature, but we're in, we're at, and it's a super hyper focus. We both have our headphones and there's not a lot of verbal communication, but our nonverbal communication is to the point where like we kind of can feed off each other's, you know, serious tone. So even though she's not competing or, or I don't want to say not taking training seriously anymore, she's just not, not competing in anything. Um, it's still nice to have that like back and forth where like you go, I go, you go, I go. And even we're doing different movements, you know, I know that she keeps an eye on me and I keep an eye on her to make sure that, you know, neither of us are in a position to get hurt. But at the same time, it's kind of nice to kind of turn your brain off, have some, you know, me time. But at the same time, if you need that support, that person's right there for you too. So that's been something I rather enjoyed as well too. Cause if you try to get hyped up for every single session and I train five days a week and I have like another seven weeks of training to go before my next meet. I'm going to get myself exhausted, just burnt out even before I get to the platform. Yeah. Like you, you mentally can only put so much energy into it. And there is that stage of mental burnout with training. And I love, we just did a, I did a meet down in Rhode Island and there was a, it was like a memorial for a football coach. And so this whole football team did this powerlifting 
Oh God. <laughs> uh, this powerlifting meet. And there's a bunch of high school kids. And these kids were like, there was one kid that was so amped up for every lift. And it was like, part of me wishes I had them but like, dude, you're, you're, if you do this every day, like you're going to, you're going to be in a bad place pretty soon. And I, I don't know where that's going to be, but it's, uh, it's interesting to see like how hyped some of these kids get, but like the more and more high level people get, the more kind of even killed I've noticed these people get. Like it's like nothing throws them for a loop. Like you said, kind of cerebral and just, it's like, yep, this is it. This is what I'm doing today. And you know, I don't need to scream. I don't need to stomp and do this and that like once in a while when you need it to like, you know, redline the engine. But other than that, it doesn't need to be that way. Um, Absolutely. And so, so that kind of actually, this is a very well flowing conversation here. So, so my next point, that I've always uh, noticed, and uh, I forget which coach said it, but I listened to a podcast not too long ago, and this is about weightlifting. But he said uh, he was asked, you know, what is what is the number one thing that all your successful people um, do? And it was, and he's coached a couple of people that have made it to the Olympics, and his thing was thrive on the mundane, right? Mm-hmm. So. He's like, these sports are boring. There's, you know, for us, there's three movements, you know, clean, jerk, and then snatch. And then for powerlifting, it's squat, bench, deadlift. So uh, for a lot of people, these things can get very boring. Mm -hmm. Uh, For me, they don't. I am obsessed with with the weightlifting movements. Like, it's always that, like like I said, like this inferiority of there's always something I could do better. I'm never happy with the progress I had. Like, yes, I'll have good days and I'll be satisfied with that. But there's still, I still want a higher total. I still want to place higher in meets. I still want to go farther with my career. Um, so it's just really seeing like simple works. We need to master the fundamentals. And I think a lot of people don't want to work on those basic prerequisites. You know, a lot of people just want to put heavy weight on the bar and squat as much as they can. And and like, you know, we see this with these high school kids and kids want to impress people and and do this and that. But like, if you want to really be true to the sport, like the higher, higher level you get, it's like the more and more non-impressive most of your training gets. Would you agree? Oh, hundred uh, percent. It's just really funny because you remind me of a quote that I've either stole or, or changed slightly to make it my own. Um, I always tell people just take what the barbell gives you that day. Like whether it's like an RPE seven day, you know, you're going for like a 90% double, whatever the training requires of you to do, just take what the barbell gives you, especially when things are not, optimal like say you didn't sleep well you didn't eat or you didn't hydrate whatever it may be you know if you have to go for a pr a day or some sort of number just do what the best you can for that certain day and just realize that like that's what you're capable of for that particular training session and that you don't live and die by it so it's very interesting that that weightlifter from that podcast said something kind of similar to like kind of live in the mundane but i think you also have to realize that you know at least from a powerlifting perspective like you just have to do what you're capable of that day as well too and don't overstress or over extend yourself to do something that you may be capable of on paper but in the intermediate and long term it might actually ruin your whole block of training um and i do think you know it's really funny to bring up though that you're obsessed with those movements i am obsessed with all three movements to this day like i don't normally talk about how much i love to see people squat bench and deadlift or to nitpick or pick apart every single thing and you know, as much as uh, I enjoy <coughs> the company of my girlfriend, you know, there's definitely some times where I've seen her at the gym where there's like three or four things that I just want to like just kind of fix. And that's because that's kind of where my brain goes or like any of my training partners where like there's this one thing with like their either their ankle, their foot position, their foot pressure, the way that they're holding the bar, the way that they even approach the bar, where it's like it's always comes down to technical, muscular or um, what is it? Technical, muscular or mental. And there's always these three different pillars of approaches that I notice whenever somebody approaches the bar that like there could always be something better. And I still look at my own technique as mediocre at best because I don't think I'm the most technically savvy squatter bench or deadlifter. I do muscle things up a lot. And a lot of the things that I wish I could do better is to be more of a much of, of a technician, especially when it comes to like the deadlift and the bench. Cause although I'm a decent squatter, I think that has more to do with my proportions than with anything with my technique. And I feel like I can add like another 20 to 30 pounds on both my bench and deadlift if I was just a little bit more technically savvy. And that's like the first thing I see whenever I see my lifts is like, that could have been so much prettier. Like I, I'm such an ugly lifter when it comes to those two movements, especially. 
I tried to lead the horse to water, but I couldn't make him drink it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just so annoying to like see like uh like I look at my bench video from like this morning. I'm like, dude, like why are your feet uneven? Like they could be they could if they were even, you could have made that lift a whole lot easier than it needed to, you know, than it that it should have been. You know, I worked up to like four thirty, four forty for a triple today, and it was an RPE nine when it should have been a seven just because I could tell that my foot position was off. But you can't do that in the moment, but afterwards you're like dude, I need to be better at benching. Like I just have to kind of not reinvent the wheel, but there's always something that you can clean up. And that's also something that drives me to be a better lifter. Is like, if I want to bench 600 one day, it's got to be like the most perfect bench. Cause there's no way in hell I have any business touching that weight unless my technique is 50% better than what it currently is. Yeah. And that, you know, this all brings up a lot of like, you know, there is an art to coaching it. And the longer I coach, I think through reflection and trial and error and things like I get better as a coach and there's so many different pieces to it. And um, I think that's what separates the best from the good or the great is being able to take it and, and see it for what it is and being attentive to it, but maybe not like going overzealous with it. Right. Like you as a lifter, for example, as we said, like, or you self-admitted, right? Like maybe you're not the most technical lifter. Are there things I would still like to see better with your technique? Yeah. But you also like, there's a certain aspect of movement quality that's like, just isn't always there. Like your hips are really stiff. Your T-spine doesn't rotate, right? Your pecs are really tight. And some of that is just adaptation of sport too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's this positive trait. Maybe, you know, we have some upside to it and some downside, but we want to get all these things better, but at the same time, like if we just focus on what we can do with it and what we have, like we'll be okay. Um, and we can still, still make progress yet having the, having the mindfulness to be like, yeah, I need to focus on this a little bit more. Um, cause some people just look at the squat, like, yeah, that's simple. Like, you know, bodybuilder bros are always like, yeah, I'll just, you know, squat. It's up and down, bend the knees. It's like, no, no, there's a whole lot that goes into this, right? Mm-hmm. Of, yeah, foot pressure, hip position, intention with the hip, intention with the ankle, intention with the foot, intention with the upper back versus the core. It's all, there's all so many little pieces that like look so simple, yet mm-hmm. as a lifter, throughout training, we're always trying to do something with it. Um, and it's being attentive to those details where I think a lot of people are like, yeah, I got it. Like, I'm good. It's like, okay, but what if you focused on this piece a little more? And that's like a lot of what we did together too, of like, Mm -hmm. we worked on your deadlift, like your left foot, like you didn't have an arch to your foot that you knew how to use and like rooting, Uh, Mm -hmm. something that like small little details that can like make a big difference in someone at your level that I think separates a lot of people from you is those little things of like, you're mindful of it. Like, yes, do we get the optimal outcome all the time? No, but we're attentive to it and we make progress on it through and through which is the cool part of that. Oh, no, for sure. And to give you some props as well, too, like the way that you look at things in a non-binary fashion and look at it more as a spectrum between stability and mobility and trying to find what's optimal, maybe not necessarily in terms of the long term, but at least optimal for that day. You know, when I do any sort of, I'm going to say mobility work in heavy quotes here, because I know that that could be a a YouTube rapid hole and a half and another podcast episode in its entirety. Um, The things that we have worked on in the past are things that like, I may not put on my social media necessarily, but there are the things that I still do, whether it is a lot of the foot stuff or a lot of the calf work or ankle mobility stuff that you had me do, or even the T-spine stuff, um, simply because that's what's made me better in terms of making any progress on top of the program that I do. And then realizing that like, you know, sleep quality, nutrition quality, hydration quality, they play a huge factor in terms of like my T-spine. Like if I don't drink enough water, I can tell that I'm going to be really stiff, you know, it's a conventional pull. And then, you know, my upper back is not in the best position ever. And then I'm more of in a flexion and then it's supposed to be in a little bit more extension and just working on things to kind of, whether or not it's like a toothbrush or a little pickaxe where you kind of like brush it a little bit to make sure that you kind of open up certain positions or certain movement quality or even tissues for that day um, makes a huge difference. Just not in terms of like just lifting, but in terms of just feeling good. Like I had a crappy deadlift day on Wednesday because I was forcing myself to pull sumo when my left abductor was just really annoying and it probably comes down from the foot just because that's always been the case whenever the my left foot, as you know, tends to go to shit. So does the rest of my leg. 
Um, I did a couple of different drills that we worked on and then switched back to conventional when I had one of the best conventional days in a while where I, you know, paused deadlifted like 620 for doubles and then ended up doing 660 for a double at the end. And I had one of my best days because I was just not in pain. And one of the things that I did learn from you was like, do the things that don't hurt and don't try to force things that may be good on paper. But if you're in pain all the time, then, then why are you doing it? You know, there's the difference between torture and training. And I think a lot of people forget that, like, it's supposed to be uncomfortable, but you should never be, like, bracing yourself to be like, this is really going to hurt. I really hope something doesn't tear. And even at this day and age, like, I still worry about that stuff. And then that should be sending red flags to me and being like, Brett would tell you, stop, do something different, and be in a position where you're not in pain. Because that should be the feedback of telling you to stop to begin with. And, uh, yeah. you know, that is something that I did learn from me and that I still, you know, stick to to this day. Yeah. And sometimes that just comes down to mastering the fundamentals of like, and this is where people don't want to look and go to. It's like, well, you know, could we just shift your weight a little bit? Like if it's a deadlift and you feel your hamstring, like, could we sit back more in your heels? Are we too far in your heels? Do we need to shift forward? Mm-hmm. Like, do we have the the sensory integration there? to feel what that difference could be and that like one might not be better than the other per se. They might be the same. It's just different. Uh, but do we know what different is and how to change it and, and manipulate it? And that's comes down to like, have we done enough work with the, the basic prerequisites of, of joint control to do that? Um, so it's just one, one big thing of like, it's simple, but there's so much to the simple that it, it can become very complex. And I think too many people just overlook it. Oh, absolutely. I think most people don't even think about it at all. I think that's like the number one thing that makes the difference between a beginner and intermediate and advanced lifter is having even those thoughts to begin with. Cause I didn't have those thoughts until I was, you know, maybe like I said, like, like a, an elite lifter because like, well, if I can't put on like another 50 pounds of body weight or muscle or whatever, cause I'm going to stay in this weight class, how am I going to get stronger? And that's going to be more, you know, neuromuscular as opposed to just, putting size on and things of that nature as well too. And the same with technique. So like you have to maximize what you have as well too. And I do think technique or proper technique for what works at the time is going to come down to, like you said, like joint control, you know, body awareness and just realizing what's optimal in terms of foot pressure or foot placement, hand placement, et cetera, et cetera. Cause yeah. I'm only weighing 205 to 210 nowadays and I'm lifting just as much weight, if not more than I was 15 to 20 pounds heavier. And I think a lot of that has to do with just, having really good body awareness and knowing when to activate or use certain parts of, of my body versus not from before. And I do think that does come down to like a, a very high level sense of body awareness. Yeah. And just the approach a high level lifter has to the bar, right? It's like you guys know your stuff. So like if I'm working with someone that's newer and you know, a lot of times nowadays I'm working on injury rehab or prevention or whatever. It's like, you know, we'll get someone back to getting under bar. I'm like, okay, when you squat, what do you think about? And they'll just, someone on the newer novice side will be like, I just, I don't know. I just squat. It's like, well, what are your steps? You know, what steps? Like the steps you take to get under the bar, how do you set yourself up? It's like, I don't know. I just do it. Where when I work with someone more high level like you, it's like, okay, yeah, I take three steps into the bar. I get myself under it. I put my hands here. I wiggle my back into it and then I walk out and then I think X, Y, Z, Z, the other. And then my descent, I start with thinking about this, that, the other, right? Right. Uh, a lot of it comes down to that setup, but there's so many details in that that setup, which mm-hmm. like someone looks at it, it's like, oh, that looks really simple. He's just getting under the bar and walking out. It's like, there are so many thought processes in this, but then like, you know, and, th- and then the detail of knowing, you know, 60 to 70 percent for you in training you might have three or four cues you're thinking about when over 90 percent like you have one thing you you get to think about really mm-hmm. and it's knowing that detail of that if i think about two things this might not go as well as if i only think about one thing so it's just really interesting to to see how much detail goes into these things and well, um for sure i recently and, did a uh, video for juggernaut about just the walkout for the squat yeah. not even the squat part but like literally just focusing on just a one step or three step walkout. And it was like a 15 minute video where I basically nerded out about my approach and how I set up everything to make sure that regardless of the bar position, whether it's high bar, medium or, or low bar, that this should be your approach when you walk the weight out because it's going to make or break a max attempt. And yeah. 
I think you would enjoy that video because that's stuff that you're really into, but most lifters overlook that part. And you see it at meets too, where everybody overlooks their walkouts, where I think that that's literally how you can tell if a lifter is going to make or, or not make their attempt at all is the way that they even approach it. Yeah. It's funny that and it's, that. it's that. And then when someone high level changes something, it's like the little most finite detail. And it's like, well, I've been working at this for three months. It's like working at what? It's like, I turned my toes up two more degrees. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, but like, yeah. those are the details that, that sometimes do matter. Uh, oh, absolutely. If, if you've been having hip pain and, and hip impingement and your hip doesn't move well, sometimes that little detail and attention to it will be like, oh, maybe that's what is making this happen and versus moving them out makes it not happen. So let's keep doing that oh, no, and be cognizant sure. of it. You know, for me, it's like just externally rotating a little bit more, like maybe two degrees more than I normally have because I have more of a straight knee type of squatter where I don't really push my knees out. And now that I have a little bit more space in the hip where I don't feel pain as I, you know, externally rotate my hips a little bit. Now I'm like, oh, depth is a lot easier. Whereas like before, you know, I think you used to make fun of me. It's like, uh, you know, it takes like three or 400 pounds for me to even hit depth just because I let my hip flexors be so jacked up that i need that type of weight in order to hit depth which is just like a, a walking injury waiting to happen and just having mm -hmm. that like little bit of awareness of like okay maybe i don't necessarily hit depth with just the bar but like if we can get like you know 135 to depth i think we're going to be okay as opposed to three or four hundred pounds because those are also warning signs of like maybe you should probably like rethink your approach a little bit too yeah exactly so uh those are five. The last one I had on here, because we kind of added one in the middle of our conversation here, was, uh, and I think we've kind of touched on this a little bit, was just being humbled, um, knowing there are always people that are out there that are better than you and know more than you. And not only that, but instead of saying, yeah, screw that guy, I hate that guy, like, because he's more successful than you, having, maybe having the ability to walk up and ask that person questions about how they got to where they are. Yeah. I mean, I was the annoying kid and I probably still am the annoying kid in some respect. Uh, when I first walked into TPS, I literally walked up to the strongest, biggest dude at the gym, which was a, a bad idea in hindsight. And I asked him like, how do I, how do I become like you? And from the get go, I've always just been always asking somebody stronger than me. Or when I had training partners that were stronger than me, like I took notes, I wrote down in my training journals back when we had pen and paper to write everything, not on apps necessarily, and just wrote what they said or anything passed by. Or I saw somebody that was really strong in a particular lift, like even if it was like the overhead press, I just wanted to ask them like, how do you do it? Or like, how do you approach it? And nowadays, um, you know, when it comes to like my personal relationship, like, you know, whenever I talk to Laura about something, like I asked her like, does this look right to you? Because when she has a couple minutes of free time at the gym and stuff like that, like I asked her like, how does my upper back look? Because, you know, I'm feeling this and this and this. Do you see that? And even if it's not somebody that's stronger than me necessarily, they have expert eyes. You know, the same thing with you. If I ever ask you to look at something, you know, I want your expert opinion on it because you not only can see movement better than I can, but also you're going to give me something as unbiased as possible as well, too. And I think when you rely on other people in that regard for support, you know, you're asking them not only, hey, where do I suck, but also what can we do to make it better? And I think a lot of lifters make the mistake of finding coaches that are just stronger than them because they're like, well, he's stronger than me. So he definitely knows how to get me to where I want to be. Or they look at, People like that. Some, aren't in some people are, strong. some people are just strong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you have to separate and have that awareness of like, is this person strong because they're, they're technically savvy. They've done all, I don't want to say the right way of going about it, but did they do every single thing and left no stone unturned to get stronger? Or are they just like full strong and they're just going to be squatting 500 pounds the first time they ever squatted, you know, and recognizing those differences of like, who got here because of technique and nutrition and, and training versus somebody that's just, you know, bull strong. And I think a lot of people make those mistakes in terms of finding their coaches and the same thing in terms of finding their lifting partners. Cause I've definitely trained with some people that are just naturally gifted. And if I ask them like, Hey, how do you do your bench? They're like, I don't know. I just take the bar and I just bring it down and press it. Um, and there's no finesse to it or no take home points other than like, I just eat a lot <laughs> and I just bench a lot because that's how I got my bench to be where it's at. So recognizing those, those differences make a huge um, help in terms of like being a better lifter and then also finding a good coach and being a better training partner as well too. So I think uh, when I think of terms of humility or humbleness, that's where I tend to gravitate to. Cause I know that like on paper, I'm not going to find many people stronger than me unless they're like a super heavyweight, 
but I'm humbled in the sense of like when I ask somebody that um, is better than me in different ways, because, you know, I'm only good for three things. Um, I take them as seriously, <laughs> if not more seriously than say another powerlifter. Like I take you way more seriously than any of my training partners. Cause like your expert opinion means a lot more weighted to me than, than most people I, I meet in the strength and conditioning world, you know, for example. Yeah. And uh, you know, that that's something interesting too. And um, something I kind of uh, see in that. And you know, a lot of people look at me like, yeah, I'm not the strongest person. Uh, I've never been the best athlete. I, I got into this, I think, part of my drive was that, and this comes back to my inferiority complex, right? I knew I wasn't the best athlete. I wanted to be better. I, I, I want to be the best. I always kind of know, like, I never will be the best. Like, just, you know, genetically, I didn't get that gift. Like, yeah, I got a really smart brain. I got a doctorate in school and like, it wasn't that hard for me to achieve. But genetically, physically, I just, you know, I don't have what some people are wired with. And I'm okay with that because what it's given me is the the effort to work harder and like, when I was in high school, um, I started on as a on the varsity football team, not because I was the best. It's like I was the only freshman, eighth grader, and yeah, eighth grader, freshman, and sophomore that was in the weight room five days a week lifting and learning how to be faster, be stronger. And then like I got obsessed with that mm -hmm. of like I got done there and I'd go home and I'd start reading articles. How do I get bigger? What's creatine do? How does that work? What do I drink it with? Um you know, do I would drink it with grape juice, coffee, orange juice, or water? Um, what, how much protein do I need? Uh, all those little details that I got into, and then and then it stemmed into movement and working out of like, how do I, how do I get my bench stronger? How do I get my deadlift stronger? What do I got to do with this and that and this? And it's like, and then I started exercise physical. It's like, well, this is enough. I want to know not just how to do it, but more of the why behind what happens when it breaks down. And it was a doctorate. So it's like, okay, now, now I need to know this. And I'm still like not where I want to be with my doctorate and even all things I've been able to accomplish. I still want more. And for someone like you to look at me who I've squatted 405 once, uh, I can deadlift 500, but I have shitty hips basically. I think they're worse than yours, but, um, you know, no excuse, no excuses there, but, uh, like a lot of people like you and be like, why is he choosing him as a coach? Like he's not nearly as strong as him. He's not on the same level, but it just comes down to like, I've taken the time to put a lot of attention into the details to know what it takes. And I'm still learning too. Like, you know, we, I think we learned a lot together. And even now, like it's been what, three years since we had that experience since, yeah, it was probably 2019. Yeah. I remember right before the pandemic. Yeah. It's just one of those things where like, I just think, um, not that having a PhD necessarily means that like you know everything, but I do think that like the work that it takes into that is going to be, it, that's more weighted to me and maybe because I'm, you know, secretly want to be an academic for the rest of my life as well too. So there's that bias, but like, I just, for, you know, for whatever reason, like I look at someone like you and then I look at like, say, you know, average Joe PT or average Joe personal trainer. And like, I know you've sought out all this stuff, you know, similar to how I sought out. Like when I first started training, like I, went to a bunch of seminars. I taught a bunch of CrossFit seminars at one point um, when it came to like learning the powerless or teaching the powerless. So I have a lot of experience in that stuff. So when I do, when I used to do more coaching, you know, a few years ago, you know, I stuck to my lane in terms of being a powerlifting coach, but I sought out people like you. I sought out, like say, like I said, Zach um, for my hamstring. And when I asked him, you know, well, what can I do right now to make things better? Not just the bare minimum. And he gave me a checklist and I did a lot of those things. So I, I respect guys like that who constantly seek out information you know, I may not necessarily agree with every single powerlifting coach in the area around here because I know a few of them are a little polarizing, but I still want to hear what they have to say because they're always constantly seeking out information. They don't just stay stagnant. And for me, when I find people like that, whether it's, like I said, Erica Titan or, you know, or even Steve Brown at CSC, like, you know, Steve's been, he's 70, you know, 75, 77 years old and he's still learning how to powerlift. And like, you don't get to where he's at, where he's still squatting, you know, 400 pounds at that age. Um, because you just kind of get complacent. And I think that's the most important thing for me when I look at somebody that I want to hire or, or, or examine me or try to look, look at my training is like, are they still constantly learning? You know, Chad is still very much like constantly trying to find the next big thing in terms of like the app, in terms of like training, you know, in terms of, you know, jujitsu, you know, not necessarily maybe just powerlifting. Cause like he's pretty much mastered that area, 
but there's still a lot of things that I know that he still wants to learn from a coaching perspective that like he wants to fill those gaps as well too. And that's one of the reasons why I like him as a coach as well is because he's just constantly trying to learn as much as possible. And I think that that drive makes me feel comfortable knowing that like you may not know the answer now, but you're going to. And to me, that's more and more important than just being strong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, that was, that was one of my key moments in learning about being successful too was, um, I had a professor who taught me, you know, a lot of what I know come back and be a client of mine. And I was like, why do you want to be a client of mine? She's like, she's like, you, she's like, you're always just posting. She's like, I see you're like a course. that seems like every other weekend, you're always posting about what you're learning. And I want to surround myself with people that are on the front edge of that. So I think that's, that's probably, you know, another bit is find the people that are always, seeking self-improvement for themselves that can help you too oh for sure and to me that's like way more important than whether or not you ever squatted more than 400 pounds like you know that's just like i always think of like barbell lifting regardless if it's powerless or anything like that it's just like a it's like a physical manifestation of just where you are currently in life and you know i know that you don't necessarily take the powerless as seriously as weightlifting but that's because like those aren't your priorities too so i know that too so i think having contacts and nuance of like who you're talking to is also really important. I think, um, you know, if I ask you like, hey, can you help me get more mobile so I can get into a full snatch position? I'd be working with you every single day for like a year, you know, years on end until I do. Um, because I know- Let's that give that one a decade. Yeah, probably more like 10 years. But like, that's one of those things where like, you know, you and I both know how to get stronger in terms of that power, but I don't necessarily know how to get more mobile and athletic to do into a full snatch position too. So just like understanding like, not necessarily that the powers are your weaknesses per se, but I just know how much you love weightlifting that like it comes down to like, if I'm going to ask somebody to like fix my body in terms of that, in terms of those two positions, um, I'll be going to you. Cause I know that you'd be looking at everything with like through a fine comb and brushing it back and forth to make sure like, all right, what does Carlos need to do to get him into this full snatch position, even with just a broomstick, let alone like a barbell and, um, and that type of obsession and, and commitment and investment to a person you're not going to find many people like that outside of like, you know, the weightlifting facilities at the Olympic training center, you know? So like having people like that in your life. And like I said, I'm very lucky that I have someone like you close by, you know, relatively speaking, and I don't have to go to like California or Washington, you know, on the other side of the country to have that same type of quality accessibility as well too. So I think just understanding that like we have a lot of good resources in this area. We're very, I'm very thankful that we have as many strong people as we do. But we also have just as many, if not more smart people, that are really obsessive with this stuff that like you can drive 20, 30 minutes, any direction in the greater Boston area. And you're going to find really good quality expert and content to make you a better athlete. So I think not taking advantage of talking to you, talking to other gym owners, talking to other PTs, like I do think excellence breeds excellence. And I think that a rising wave brings up all ships. And I think having all these options is a great thing too. Cause I know if I, you know, once I go to architect, there's probably going to be a whole can of new people that I've never met that are very talented, very smart and know their stuff. And it's going to make me want to be even stronger or more talented or more smart to get, to stay on top of my game. Because although I may be powerlifting now, I don't know what the next phase of my life is going to look like once I hang up the singlet. And, um, you know, I want to be sure that like, no matter what I do next for a passion is going to be something that I can still stay on top of and still keep on learning as well too. Yeah. And I don't care about training the powerless myself, but for everyone out there, I do obsess over the powerless. I do still coach powerlifting and, <laughs> um, inferiority. And, and, and so that's one of my drives is like, when someone tells me I can't do something, yeah. I'm going to do it. Uh, oh, no, for sure. So I someone out to- there, <laughs> someone out there told me I can't coach powerlifting and, uh, just so happens we made it to the podium at mega nationals this year with one of my lifters. And then I have another one that's just out on entry that uh, will hopefully be there next year, but also just took third in her first weightlifting meet. So, Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So I still obsess over the power lifts. I just, I don't, I don't love training them as much as I love my, my self, how technical and mental and everything weightlifting is. I actually, I like coaching powerlifting more than I like coaching weightlifting sometimes. Um, yeah. It's just a whole different beast of like, it's just a different mental state to, oh, to no, coach. Sure. 
And with, for the record, when I said that, I meant you personally. I know that we're coaching. It's a very yeah. different. Come on, Carlos. Don't put me down on my own show. Yeah. I'm not putting you down on your own show. No, I meant to say you personally. Like, I know that you get, like, more horny for a clean and jerk or a snatch than, like, you going for, like, a max squat attempt. You know, low bar anyway. I mean, high bar, I'm sure that's a different story. But, you know. Max, I, max I, I know squat, anything. Going. Max squat, anything just hurts my hips these days. So, yeah. Uh, so, that's that's what I meant by it. But, no, that's that's awesome, too, that you have some talented uh, people coming up the ranks as well, too. I mean, that's that's pretty sweet. You know, yeah. uh, it's it's kind of cool to talk about people that are up and coming. And then, you know, when I was uh, watching Marisa's like retirement um, stuff, you know, at her last uh, IPF Worlds and everything like that, and seeing it on the other end of that aspect, that was also very humbling because I know that I've talked about retirement like at least six times. Carlos, <laughs> you have retired six times. Yeah, I have retired six times. But it's it's also one of those things that we're, when we're talking about being humbled, I know that I'm in the last few years of few prime years of training because, like I said. Um, you know, because I've had this conversation recently as well, too. Like, I don't want to be a master's lifter. Like, if I ever sign up as a master's, like, or sub-master's, put me out to put me out to pasture, basically. Um, so I told myself, you know, 35, um, if I'm still relatively really healthy, I'll keep going meat by meat. But 35 is sort of like that line of like, okay, if I accomplish all my goals by then, great. If not, and if I'm starting to feel a little broken, maybe it's time to hang it up because even at some point I need to – change change goals and shift a little bit where it's like you know i want to be as passionate about my the other things that are going on in my personal life outside of powerlifting that i need to not ignore anymore because i've spent the last 16 17 years already obsessive over the sport that like i have to draw the line for myself otherwise i'm going to be in this infantile state of like staying in the same rut because as much as i don't like stagnation or being a rut in terms of training in terms of like not making prs I think from a more bigger perspective of in terms of like what I want to do with my life, I don't want to be in the same type of rut that I'm kind of in purposely with powerlifting, but that's because I'm still in love with it. But I also know that like, I want to do a lot of traveling, a lot of other things that um, don't require me to have a barbell every other day to accomplish. And I have to kind of put that on the back burner. So, you know, when I saw Marisa talk about retirement and moving on to other things as well, too, it was also very humbling that like, you know, I maybe have, anywhere from two to five years left of like really solid competition level training, but realizing that it's not a scary thing to walk away from this because it's always going to be there. And it's pretty cool that it's always going to be a part of my life and that it's okay if I don't become the next John Hack or beat John Hack, although that is still my ultimate goal and very unlikely, but I'm still going to go for it because why not me? But at the same time, also realize that like seeing somebody that as great as Marissa is, retire you know i don't remember all her best prs or all her best all-time numbers i just remember that she was the, one of the consistent high level women powerlifters of all time and she's in my personal hall of fame and for me that's kind of where i want to be where like hopefully if i do enough in the next few years that hopefully i can maybe not be considered the best of all time but at least be in the conversation of like somebody that's been consistently good for a very long time and competed at a high level and maybe people will not necessarily know my best numbers, but they know that like I was one of the best or better lifters of this era. And for me, that's that's kind of like a cool thing to think about because although, like I said, number one is still the ultimate goal, just being considered in that conversation would be not just humbling in and of itself, but like a really cool thing to be proud of as well too. You know, seeing it from both as an intermediate or a beginner and now seeing, you know, someone as high level as her, you know, walk away from it and be proud of what she still did. Because I kind of want to end, end my powerlifting career on, on a similar term where it's like, I'm not necessarily going to be broken, but at the same time, I can walk away on my own two feet and not have to be in a wheelchair. <laughs> yeah. Because 800 pounds could kill a couple people. <laughs> yeah, it could kill a couple people. So, I mean, we'll see in October because that's that's ultimately what I want to do. And my next meet is the squat 804. Because as long as John doesn't break 804 the week beforehand at the Pro-Am, I'm going to try to attempt the world record squat at, uh, in Chicago. Cause that's when my next meet is. Is that going to be at 198? Yeah. Um, like I said, I've been purposely walking around at 207. I know John's been keeping his weight at like 212. Mm -hmm. So I know he's going to try to attempt it again in September 24th. And then I think the following weekend or two weekends after that is the October 7th, which is on a Friday. And that's when I'm going to be competing next. So I know he wants to get 804. And if he doesn't, I'm going to try to go for it myself. Now, um, what federation is that? Uh, they're both USPA. So he's doing the pro am in Kansas okay. City, and I'm doing another pro am, the Surge Pro Am in Chicago, October seventh. Mm -hmm. 
And the only reason now, why I'm not doing the same meet as him is because two of my juggernaut teammates are also doing the one in Chicago. So Chad offered to handle and coach all three of us. And I can't say no to that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that'd be uh, cool. Now, you just recently did a meet too. And um, was it APF? Uh, yeah, it was an APF meet in May. Uh, that was like... That wasn't a meet that I wasn't too con- like in retrospect. I wasn't too proud of because like my squat was kind of meh, and then my deadlift was kind of a gift. So I actually redid that, uh, redid basically those same numbers at one ninety eight instead of two twenty because I didn't make weight because I was fat. I'll be honest with you, I was just fat <laughs> cutting from two twenty eight to two hundred five. And then uh, six weeks later, I did an RPS meet kind of on a whim because I didn't even tell Chad. He was kind of not mad, but he was like, "Don't do that again," uh, because it just. I've never had a gifted meet before where like I knew that I should not have total what I total that day. And it just left such a bad taste in my mouth. And I, I want to have some respectability when I compete because I don't want gifted lifts that I did some dieting. I tweaked my training, did some more work on the hamstring. Cause like my hamstring was still kind of bothering me even up to May and did another meet at a uh, MedFit on July 10th. And I did seven, essentially the same numbers, 760, 500 and 700 on the deadlift. And I just did that at 198 as opposed to 220. Um, and it was to depth. Because <laughs> that was like the number one thing that I kept watching at this APF meet was like I was borderline, if not a little high. And I just don't want to do a meet questioning my credibility. I uh, I saw your deadlift. And I, I saw they gave you your last deadlift. And I was like, ugh, I don't know. Yeah, the, exactly. I don't want the ugh. Because I, I even saw that and I was like, ugh, that was a gift. So, you know. And no one, I mean, not that I do meets for the YouTube comments or for people being like, hey, that was a shit meet. But like, I, I like, as soon as I looked at everything, I was like, this, this isn't what I'm capable of. Like, this is, this is shit, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to kind of give myself a, a, another shot at it before I turned 33 because my birthday is July 17th. So I, there was a meet literally the Sunday beforehand. And I said, you know what? I want to make sure that I end my 32nd year of life on a good note basically do a do over and do a meet where I can actually be proud of, even if I don't necessarily hit PRs. And like I said, I hit 1960, the same weight at a lower weight class. And like I said, my deadlifts bench and squat were all technically sound. And I'm much more proud of that meet than I was at May. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that like, I was still kind of nervous with the hamstring and then just having a camera crew there was kind of interesting that I need to kind of like wrap my head around a little bit more. Uh, Cause like I yeah. said, the juggernaut guys are really cool, but like the content creation aspect of it, Definitely feels a little weird to be talking to a camera. I'm a lot better with it now, but at that meet, I was like trying to be meat mode Carlos and then trying to do the whole switching back and forth. That flipping the switch was just a little too much for me. Something else to get used to. Yeah. Um, like said, it's the whole influencer thing is a little, it's still a little weird to me, but uh, yeah. in a good way, you know, because there's things that you didn't necessarily have to think about that you have to think about now that when I'm competing that I have to just be mindful of. So that's just kind of experience, just like anything else. Yeah. For sure. So uh, I think that's everything we have for today. So that was a pretty good talk and we went pretty in depth on some of these things. So Carlos, um, where can people find you? Do you, do, are you offering coaching to anyone right now or anything too? I'm not uh, because um, I don't want to step on Chad's toes. There's a couple things coming up ahead with the app that I'm um, not necessarily um, that hopefully there's a collaboration between him and a friend of mine that hopefully that would make the app a little bit more uh, for the general public as well too. Um, I really can't say because they literally just started talking this past week about it. Um, but I've kind of stopped coaching for now because um, my nine to five has been pretty much all encompassing. And then, like I said, I've had some pretty radical personal life changes. Like I said, like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm in Linfield at the moment and I live in Chelsea. So trying to take care of the family life has been my number one priority when it doesn't come to priority in my career. So um, you can talk to me and ask me questions about training in general through the Wolves of Winter through my Instagram. Um, you can also email me at, at carloswmoran at iCloud.com if you want to um, with general questions. And especially if you're using the Juggernaut app, you know, I'm going to help you with all that stuff as much as possible. But um, in terms of coaching, I'm going to wait until I retire to kind of dip my toes into it. Because like I said, I have a, uh, a personal condo gym and hopefully that could be the start of an actual gym at some point. But, you know, that's too far in the future. So really say much more than that. Gotcha. All right. Well, Carlos, thank you for coming on. It's been good talking to you. And um, yeah, we got to get you in the clinic soon because uh, if your hamstring is still bugging you too, that new device will, that, that shockwave device, like, dude, it's, it's 
like no, annihilating sure. everything in a good way. Yeah, um, I, mean, can, I can always make a trip up there. I know I have the seminar uh, the 27th for Juggernaut. I mean, I can go up there either next Friday or Saturday. I mean, I work from home Mondays and Fridays, so I could even go on a Monday too. Yeah, Monday nights. Actually, I'm in Concord Monday nights. But anyways, we'll save that. We'll talk about this after. <laughs> yeah, she needs text after um, all over. Well, we'll just, we'll pause this and we could talk after for a minute. But uh, for everyone else, thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you have any uh, feedback for us, whether it be guests you want to have on, questions you want answered, um, just topics you want me and a guest to ramble about, feel free to reach out. You can reach me at Brett, B-R-E-T-T, at barbelltherapyandperformance.com or shoot us a message to the website or find us on Instagram at barbell.therapy uh, or you can check out our new gym architect fitness as well and for those that don't know we also have a new location for barbell therapy coming to barrington new jersey actually we just opened so uh, if anyone needs rehab down there as well uh, we have that for you out there so thanks for listening and tune in next time we have a couple more guests coming on uh, in the next few weeks so i've actually got quite a few guests lined up for the podcast so um i hope to say stay consistent with this and give you guys more information so thanks for tuning in and take care for now peace